Happy Friday, the 14th of January, 2022. Recently, I watched a podcast with Dan Carlin of Hardcore History interviewing Elon Musk, and they talked about how World War II was the first engineering war where engineers might have mattered more than the combatants themselves. It was a war of technology, a war of increasing technology. I wanted to do a reaction video talking about that. Now, I don't have a link to that uh, video for you now to reference it, but if you Google search Elon Musk or Elon Musk and Dan Carlin of Hardcore History, maybe you can go and find it. I'm going to reference a lot of different things in this conversation today. Uh, this is a free form type lecture. I hope to talk for less than an hour. Maybe you can listen to this on your way home and into your weekend. Uh, today is my standard day off from my government job. My history is in video games and strategy games. I'm a big fan of war history. My father was a war historian in, in a way, and he fought in the Korean War. Just as a quick background, I'm not an official historian. My degree is in fine art. These are some of my drawings. I'm going to call this On the Next Season of War. And why do I call it The Next Season? Well, last night I just finished watching Amazon's The Expanse, Season 6, and that TV show is proposing what will happen in a conflict 200 years in the future between the three sides of the control over the solar system, between Earth, the Martians, and the Belters. And then there's like this fourth uh, element, which is this alien group. But um, just like uh, the old adage said, war, war never changes. You're always going to have these different sides struggling for power. And I, I think that that comes from the power vacuum where if there isn't really good leadership at the top, there is a hole that needs to be filled with control. Why control? Control makes things more efficient. Control gives people calmness, peace of mind, being able to work and stuff like that. If there isn't order, there is going to be this pull for some forces to want to become in control. And then this level of control grows with the evolution of the society itself. So let's go back into it. Where... Where have we come from? War historically, where did it start from? Someone's got resources, someone's struggling, and someone else is struggling, I mean to say, and that struggling person is able to use force to get the resources from somebody else. This is one of the great lessons that I learned while making and playing Sid Meier's Civilization. I worked on Sid Meier's Civilization 4 and 5. I played 3. Um, I played a lot of history war games growing up and the usually the mechanic is to get your base started you start creating equipment you go out and grab resources and then you build better and better technologies and more and more units in order to conquer um, your opponent uh, the age of empires is a great example of that uh, gamers who play war games talk about building their economy up getting their economy up to such an ability to provide equipment material to go and fight these wars. Uh, feel free to comment and join in if you're paying attention to this live, if you're watching on YouTube later. Thanks for tuning in and checking this out and listening to me you know, talk off the top of my head. I just have a couple bullet points here and a couple images just to get me started. Back in the day, you had a guy, typically, with some weapons imposing his strength and force onto somebody else to leverage their uh, stuff away from them. And you can see that today with armed robbery for the most part. Somebody wants something of somebody else's, they use force, they can use weapons, um, and they can use the technology at hand, be it uh, a technology of a blade, or of a bat, or of a baton, or of a you know, gun, something that has been invented. Historically, whoever had the most force could dominate the battlefield. The most force was the most amount of warriors with the best equipment and the best training. And then if you had the best equipped force led with the most competent leadership with the right strategy tactics, you would probably win the battlefield and you got to control whatever the area, whatever the domain you were fighting for was. Usually if a war is prolonged, if if the fight isn't sudden, violent, and over, like the, the typically... The, the wars of antiquity where two armies would line up on a set battlefield, have it out in a day, and whoever the victor was won the whole dang thing. 
It wasn't until you got into great empires that you had prolonged campaigns where there was multiple, multiple battles that moved from the outskirts to the industrial or city center that then you had this, um, you know, more devastating wars. Typically, the longer the war plays out, the more devastating it will be for the population because the population no longer can sustain their own families. They're sustaining the force, the defensive force that's protecting them from the opponent. Over the course of these elongated conflicts, the intelligent people in these societies will adapt to whatever their opponent is doing. Uh, think about a game of football. At the halftime, I'm talking about American football. Well, actually, European football goes for this too. You see your opponent in the first half of the game. There is a break for 15 to 30 minutes in the middle of the game. The coaches and the players can get together and think about what did they see in the first half, how was the game different than what they expected, what they prepared for, and then they change strategies and come in the second half. Usually the second half of a football game, soccer or American football, has a different kind of flavor to it than the first because the strategy has changed. In sports, during the course of a regular season, the rules don't change at all. Typically the rules are decided at the beginning of the season and then they try to make the teams as even as possible, and then they play out whoever has the best team through the course of that season, and then the uh, trophy is awarded, so-and-so is the best, and then they redraft for the next season. And the rules can change. In a prolonged conflict of when death is on the line, those rules can change. In the 20th century, we've seen many things change in the rules of war. So now let me go through the really quick history. Thanks for joining me today. we got a couple people who uh, already liked the video. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate that. Previous seasons of war. We had the American Civil War, where you had the North and the South deciding over who's going to rule and who's going to create the rules for how we live in the United States. The technology at the beginning and the technology at the, ch at the end changed over the course of this four-year prolonged war. At the beginning, you had thousands of guys with rifles and you had relatively uh, new or, or old line tactics of moving, but you had rifles that were more accurate and easier to load than before. So the length of lethality greatly, greatly increased. Uh, the armies were incredibly spendy with the lives that they had. The weapons were so much more lethal than previous conflicts, including even the American revolution. Um, and this was devastating to the United States because over 600,000 casualties in this war was a big percentage of the population at the time. Um, at the beginning, on the naval side of things, you had wooden ships, and at the end, you had metal-clad ships. These metal-clad ships could take much more punishment, and it would be much harder to force them off the field of the battle to dominate the domain of whatever ocean or uh, littoral space, harbor space, that they fought themselves in. Uh, the battles of the Monitor and the Merrimack are infamous for this new sea change in engineering technology that has come to the battlefield. Um, so then, there is a new domain in the American Civil War that is in the engineering, in the science, in the physics space. And then you have, you have Morse code, well, you have long lines of transmission for the first time, and you have primitive hot air balloons and observation where now ground commanders are able to enter a new domain, which is the air, through technology, through engineering. And now they can observe their artillery fire, and they can communicate using flags or, or blow horns to the ground commanders, so then it can re-communicate to their gunnery people how to adjust fire and become more accurate and more lethal. Just got some messages. Anyway, just go check on that. World War I. I like to think of the American Civil War had a lot of tactical dress rehearsal elements for the First World War in Europe. Uh, trench warfare made its first appearance in World War I. Sorry, at a global scale. But it really existed in the battlefields of America in 1865. 1864-65, even at little... Um, even in Gettysburg in 63, the defending Union Army was digging entrenchments to hold territory. Um, the idea of digging in was a really new idea at the end of the 19th century and um, 
got uh you know was evident everywhere in World War One, which was 1917, 1914 to 17 generally. Um, and of course, there's been fortifications long before, castles, forts, these kinds of things. But having the ground troops dig into the earth themselves and create these defensive lines, I guess you could say it goes all the way back to Rome. I mean, when the Roman army would march across Europe or throughout the Middle East, uh, they were known for building a fortification every night, marching, you know, 10 to 20 miles and then leveling forests and building encampments, building fortified encampments. But really digging in and creating entrenchments and then firing from entrenchments Civil War, World War One. So World War One started out as the first industrialized war. I got to talk really briefly about the ch the giant change that gunpowder made with warfare. When you had bows and arrows and archers, to be a competent archer used to take decades of practice. I heard you know English longbowmen were so effective at taking out French knights in the Hundred Years War, which was like like thir like 1330 to 1430, give or take 50 years. I don't know the dates on that exactly. The French had all this armor on their knights. Their knights were these wealthy lords and, and uh, upper class people. They could afford chain mail and plate and swords and helmets and all these expensive things to make. And then the English were poorer, but they could train with a bow and arrow and they can get stronger and more precise and more precise and more precise. After 10 to 20 years of pulling bows every single day, you got a stronger and stronger and stronger bow until you could and the, you, you build better, stronger bows for yourself. But eventually those arrows with the right kind of technology on the tips could penetrate that armor of the knights and you could have an asymmetric fight between one kind of weapon and a... Uh, different kind of defense. Elon, uh, uh, in his conversation with Dan Carlin, talked about the rock, paper, scissors nature of World War II in terms of air power. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. My point was that with swords, with shields, with unit tactics, with formations, with soldierly things in the ancient world, it took Almost a lifetime. It took years to build up a soldier into a disciplined fighting force. To, to make somebody lethal and strong on the battlefield took conditioning. That took time. After the invention of gunpowder, you could train somebody how to fire a gun that could kill a knight in like two to three weeks. You could take a peasant and teach them the steps of using technology, gunpowder, flint, uh, these metal barrels, and... You could have gunsmiths, you have an elite class of, of uh, gunsmiths and weapon makers who could populate an entire army with these weapons. And these weapons were much cheaper to make than the armor that the knights would be wearing. So this gets into um, economic wars. The If you can make, if it costs you, let's say $10 to make armor, but only a dollar to make a bullet, Whoever's making, whoever's fighting with the bullets is going to make it economically harder to sustain the force that just decides to armor up everybody. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's becoming like the training is becoming asymmetric as these new technologies evolve. And now you have these new domains of warfare. Whereas in antiquity, warfare took place on a very short range. Man-to-man -man combat, maybe some projectile weapons with slings and arrows. And now with bullets and bombs and artillery, you're talking much greater ranges. The scope, the scale of the battle space is increasing greatly. And whoever can kill the other guy from further away with less training is probably going to win that campaign. So in World War I, we had incredible technology in terms of artillery. We could now launch shells miles. The machine guns can shoot a thousand yards. It created these vast spaces of Europe called no man's lands where nobody would want to cross it because they would get blown up with artillery or shot by machine guns. And by the end of the war, as the soldiers dug deeper and deeper into the earth for protection, there needed to be a new weapon to get into those crevices, into those trenches. And that was gas. That was chemical warfare. That was something that was invented before the war, but had become weaponized as the need arised and the soldiers and commanders were taking tremendous losses. They needed something to break the stalemate. Gas was the new weapon. Um, aircraft was a new weapon. At, used for observation in the beginning of the war, but then 
uh, weaponized heavy there to, to have machine guns, to have bombs. Bombers would drop hand grenades into these entrenchments. They would spot out locations of wherever the enemy artillery was, wiring back, calling back to their artillery guns to zero in and drop artillery to knock out the enemy's guns. And then eventually, these spotting aircraft were seemed to be so valuable. This new domain of aircraft observation was now seen to be this very important place to dominate. Then there came the invention of the interceptor, an aircraft that could fly up and then take out the observation craft, the bomber aircraft of the enemy. You have this rock, paper, scissors approach. You have the observation aircraft that is wiring back to your artillery. Then you have anti-aircraft fire coming from one side, and you have the interceptor that goes up. The interceptor, now in the air war, is like the knights of the battlefields of the past, of the medieval era. They're, they became the most important thing, because without air, without the domain of observation, you cannot tell your guns where to shoot, and then ultimately where your military to move. Maybe you want to look across the battlefield and see where a break in the line of your enemy is and then force your way through that break, through that weak spot, and get to the command, knock the command out, maybe get behind their lines, disrupt their weapon supply, and then shut them down. World War II started with the Blitzkrieg and incredible leaps and bounds in terms of air power. The theory, this is going to be referencing Malcolm Gladwell's book, Bomber Mafia, and a little bit about what Elon and Dan Carlin were talking about. There was a theory among the Bomber Mafia, which were these eggheads, big brain types uh, working out of Alabama in the United States um, in the 30s, about like, is there a way to conduct warfare that does not have the tremendous human cost that World War I did? Uh, Dan Carlin talked about in his Blueprint for Armageddon series, World War I wiped out all the wealth and gains of the 19th century in Europe. Pretty much hit a reset on a hundred years of economic and social development. Is there a way to conduct warfare in the future that does, is not so taxing? Uh, I mean, ideally, we would just play sports to make decisions or something that doesn't hurt anybody at all, but that really, we live in a brutal world. We have to accept it that the world is brutal. Nature is brutal uh and uh, there's a there's a reddit forum i like called uh nature is metal and it's not for the faint of heart it's pretty brutal it's like watching a nature documentary with all the blood and guts turned on it's it's pretty savage and people out there who do hunting you, you know this people who actually work out in the wilderness you know this if you're working on a crab ship uh let's say or like a deep sea crabbing vessel you know that the ocean is an inhospitable place and the universe is not friendly to us soft body humans, um, so we have to adapt using technology to that if you want to be a spaceman or something like that. World War II, you have this idea that what if we can disrupt the industrial machine of war so that an enemy cannot create the hundreds of miles of long, you know, you know the, if your enemy is spending the billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever was the price of these things at the time, tremendous price, to create your hundreds of miles of defenses, your fortifications and defenses around the territory you want. How do you get into that and knock it out? Can you go over it in a new domain? The Germans in World War I tried at submarine warfare and expanded that in World War II. The idea the Germans wanted to isolate England by encircling the English Isles, the UK, and then destroying all the convoy and supply ships that came to it. The United States, being a very uh, a good ally of England, kept sending supplies through into World War II, even with the submarine threat, which made it very, very expensive to do so. The North Atlantic is littered with the corpses of merchant marines and um, millions of tons of shipping equipment, oil, weapons, food, supplies, all kinds of that is all at the bottom of the sea because of the U-boats. Uh, then, but World War II also had this aircraft component. The Western Allies had this idea that we can create precision bombing weapons where we could fly over the defensive lines and precision strike the most critical and valuable and uh, least defended but important industrial centers, ball bearing manufacturing. The idea was you could shut down, like, what would it take to shut down a place like New York City? 
What was the minimum amount of bombs that you would have to drop? This was the the mind game, the the war gaming experiment that the bomber mafia did in in Alabama, and they came up with a number of like seven bombs. Like if you really wanted to shut down New York City, you could take out the bridges and a power station, and you would render New York City ineffective for a period of time. That was the idea. In practice, that didn't quite work. All the theory of the bomber mafia um, wasn't as precise in battlefield conditions. We made hundreds of thousands of bombers, and we lost hundreds and thousands of bombers trying to penetrate German airspace to uh, knock out its industrial capability. We slowed it, we damaged it, but ultimately it took encirclement from the Russians and the Allies to encircle and cut off the Germans' ability to make war. The Germans never had like a good strategic bombing campaign. Hermann Goring was a lot of talk and not actually a lot of like actual intelligence. And he was full of ideas and theory and his pilots died regularly getting shot down by the RAF and the Allies. The Poles and too. The Poles were tremendously good pilots apparently who got to England and flew um, Merlin um, Spitfires, you know, against the, against the Germans. Uh, Elon talks about how the Allies had uh, sources of good quality gasoline, petrol, to make their engines more performative versus the enemy resources. Like in Japan, they had a hard time getting good fuel. Japan had a hard time getting good steel. Even though they broke out and tried to take over a lot of territory, they couldn't sustain the war effort with the fuel that it's now the technology that you've invented to fight these future wars has a cost of material to sustain it. Do you see where I'm going with this? I hope you do. What happened to the chemical war of World War I? Well, it was so horrific and actually not that effective. The, the chemistry, the mustard gas ended up blowing back. Like the, the effects were just so horrific. Uh, I believe it was the Geneva Convention they talked about, or maybe it was Nuremberg Convention after the war. But this chemical stuff was just really a nasty way to fight. And it's one of those, uh, for whatever reason, like you could shoot people on, on the battlefield and that's acceptable. It's, I guess it's it goes back to historically like stabbing someone with a knife. Like a bullet is just a knife going really, really fast. Whereas chemistry is affecting people in this new, really, really scary way. We got to talk about biowarfare. Um, the plague of the bubonic plague of the Middle Ages was present even before. There is stories from Rome, from Greece, about plague um, ravaging the forces in, in a war or in a campaign. And it always seems like whatever, whatever pathogen is just going around in society uh, gets juiced up in a steroid injection by conflict. Why is that? Probably because you have lots of people from all over different walks of life with different immune systems getting together and sharing their germs in the training for the war and then in the battle is, battles itself. And then you have all these cuts, injuries, wounds, pathogens are getting direct access into the body, they're stewing, they're morphing, they're multiplying, and then they're spreading, especially when the soldiers come back to either heal or uh, during the war or when the war is over and these pathogens get all over the place i've read that the theory about the bubonic plague is it might have even come from kansas it might have came from a training center and was brought over spanish flu did i say bubonic plague for i forget what i just said it was brought over to the european theater and then spread in the combat there in europe plague is a giant part of warfare and international trade, things that are going around, things that get traded around the world for value um, can have a nasty, nasty side effect to it. During World War II, Japan, you know, the, the new technology was going to be the, the atomic uh, bomb, and we're, we're going to get to that. But in this meantime, there were forces who were still working on this chemical and biological weapon component. Um, in uh, There's a famous uh, unit called Unit 731 the Japanese had in Manchuria in China. It was their bioweapons laboratory. Uh, they, they talked about uh, it was a vaccine and water purification research place, but meanwhile they're doing some really nasty testing and development of weaponizing things like bubonic plague, and this is in the 30s and 40s, you know, bringing an ancient medieval uh, pathogen to the modern battlefield, and a lot of Chinese people died from this experimentation. 
this stuff is still being developed. I mean, and that ties to where we find ourselves today with vaccines and uh, COVID. Um, the technologies that we now have for combating these pathogens were developed in the battlefield hospitals and the research facilities, the war research facilities on the medical side during the previous wars. Excuse me. Okay, so the nuclear deal. We have the invention of the atomic bomb. Theorized by Einstein and other physicists at the turn of the century with some math equations, E equals MC squared, mass and energy have a relationship. The United States has the resources to actually create the first functional atomic weapon, even though Hitler had a small atomic program. The Japanese were thinking about it. They realized they didn't have the industrial capacity. One of the reasons they didn't is you need a ton of electrical power generation in order to refine and enrich uranium to a level where it can be critical enough to uh, explode in that way, to make a weapon out of it. The United States was able to do that. We had the industrial capability, the resources, the people, the, the, the space, and I guess enough material to actually make it happen. The U.S. had this monopoly on this nuclear capability for about 10 years, and then the rest of the world caught on. This atomic weapon was just so devastating that once someone has it, no one else really wants to fight directly against them. It'd be like a normal kid, you know, if, if, if there was a Mike Tyson in your high school, no one would punk on him. Like, because if you tried to pick on Mike Tyson and he punched you in the face, you're just knocked out. There's no recovery. There's, is there no point even fighting somebody with that kind of capability? Now imagine two Mike Tysons, Mike Tysons, you know, they're going to you know, fight each other to the death. And that's, what's going to happen with, nuclear weapons with powers that have nuclear weapons no longer is it just about who is the better it's that if they actually fight everyone's dying and the entire world order and economy is going to collapse these great powers it is no longer worth fighting because the cost is just too great um so we've gone from like massive power output like who has the most technological ability to create devastation to now can we become more surgical to if you want to influence something maybe you just tap it this direction just a little bit tap it in this direction just a little bit tap it in this direction a little bit then became the proxy wars korea vietnam uh, african bush wars the middle east which system is going to work Capitalism, communism, monarchies, whatever have you. Who's going to be in charge of the resources that we have? You know, military output, military capability still takes resources. So who controls the resources of manufacturing these things? Oil for your tanks and your planes got to fly. You need fuel for those things in order for them to work. Your soldiers need food. Pete, what's going on? Proxy wars. Yeah, baby. Proxy wars. Uh, and these are places where, and I, I wanted to talk about on the map why, why these proxy wars are really unwinnable by the sides. Like there was, there's a lot of criticism right now, like on the United States, like the United States is no longer a great power. They can't win in Afghanistan. They can't win in Iraq is, is what some of the critics are saying. But in previous wars, you could have a definitive victory over your enemy by completely encircling them taking out their industrial base, and then limiting their ability to fight back. You could actually knock uh, an opponent out. I'm going to bring up Japan, for instance. World War II, the, the island-hopping campaign, whether it's the Marianas, Guam, the Philippines, uh, the Marshalls, you know, any of the island bases, even Okinawa. These places can be, Okinawa's here, these places can be surrounded and cut off. They could be sieged, just like a medieval castle. And if you siege a place long enough, you limit the ability, the enemy's ability to make war. If you can still supply your troops who are sieging the enemy location, and they're still being fed and taken care of and full of ammunition, bombs, bullets, arrows, whatever have you, and the enemy doesn't have theirs, the enemy is going to lose this war of attrition and eventually, hopefully, surrender and not die to the last man like the Japanese did. 
Eventually, we encircled the island, cut off all their ability to make war, no more gasoline, no more steel coming in, bombs, bullets, bandages, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you could have a surrender, and that war, that power will no longer fight. However, in all the proxy wars, the supplies were still coming in. Korea, the West was in the South, and then the North was backed by China. We could no longer attack. China had a tremendous deterrent economically. They got the bomb eventually, but in the beginning of the Korean War, they didn't have it. But everywhere else, like Russia would be backing China. Russia's got a bomb. So where can you cut off the ability to make supply? If you wanted to physically cut this off, it would take millions and millions of men, bomb, uh, tanks, anti-aircraft, um, you know, anything in tunneling and engineering to physically cut off the supply from North Korea to the South. And then you have to defend it on both sides. That is way too expensive. We can't just knock out an enemy from doing that. The best we could hope for is some kind of diplomatic or bribing kind of way to limit their support of China into supporting the North Koreans against the South. But that's just unreasonable. And same with Vietnam. Vietnam was ultimately going to be unwinnable by the French and by the United States because we could not limit, we could not physically stop the flow of supplies from China down into the North and in down through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is in Laos and Cambodia, into the South. So it was the other way around where instead of us supplying, you know, we had a sea lane support for the South, but in every other direction, supplies was coming in and being supported. The, the Viet Cong were patronized, or being, you know, patronized the right word, supported by the North, and the North was being supported by Russia and China. And we were not diplomatically able to really strategically knock out the, the means of production by the North. So this was unwinnable. Then we flash forward to Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11. You have Iraq bordered by Syria, which is backed by Russia and you know, questionable goals in Turkey. You know, there are some who want a stable Syria, no matter, you know, who's in charge. Fine. That's the nature of the beast. But ultimately, you have Iran, who has been a hostile uh, nation to the West, specifically Israel, since the revolution in 1979. And they were continuously supplying explosively formed penetrators, bombs, bullets, food, money, mostly money, uh, but really bombs, weapons, to the insurgent fighters within Iraq. And it was going to be impossible for the Allies to cut off this entire, you know, thousands of miles of border region from where supplies could come in. You know, supplies was coming in from Syria in the West and from Iran in the East. And maybe, you know, Turkey, whatever they were doing. And it's just a supply route that we were never, we never had the willingness to cut this off. This war was unwinnable. I think ending in some kind of tie where we're, we've backed a, a freely elected government in Iraq is the best we could have hoped for. What's up, Drew? How you doing, baby? And Afghanistan, it's the same thing. People said, well, we could, we should have stayed longer. We could have pulled out. I mean, there was a way to do Afghanistan better, but ultimately we were never willing to commit that many resources to it. This is a landlocked nation and the United States is primarily a sea power. We have tremendous military capability, but the Navy is the thing that we are most dominant at. We have a Navy that is greater than eight times. Uh, it's like, no, sorry, it's greater than the next eight nations combined in terms of ships and power, just our nuclear super carrier fleet. Our ability to force project is unrivaled in the world, unrivaled. But the Navy doesn't really help us here because it's hundreds of miles from the sea to Afghanistan, it is tremendously expensive to airlift our supplies. We put ourselves in a hole where we were encircled by enemies that did not want us to be able to operate. So it got very, very expensive. I heard it took eight gallons of gasoline to get one gallon of gas to the troops in Afghanistan. It was tremendously expensive and therefore unwinnable in this war of attrition. It wasn't going to work. We were not able to create our supply routes to wage war, and they were constantly able to, or our enemies there were constantly able to reinforce and resupply from Pakistan, from the north, and from Iran in the west. It is what it is, man. So, is there a new domain that we could then, we can't fight in this 
traditional land war. We can't win in an air war here. It's too far. The, the distances are too great. Like, yes, we can get there. It's just very, very expensive to do so. So now you have these, these wars of influence. And that's what I'm calling it right now, where we have internet-based, social media-based conversations, and we're trying to figure out what's all going on. And meanwhile, you have these troll farms operating out of, you know, propaganda machines operating out of Korea and Russia and Moldova or you know, anywhere, even within England. We have now we have dispersed propaganda all over the world. And the propaganda that's coming out of the private sector is more effective than the prop, the counter propaganda or regular propaganda coming out of the governments. Because the, this is a new domain that the governments of the world are not as equipped to dealing with as the innovative young people who who grew up and evolved with this emerging new technology. I think that's where we are right now. Um, but I think a lot of the real world domains have been settled. And I actually think, I'm actually optimistic that because, because of the nuclear deterrent and that there is no way to go in and fight off the... Um, influence and the patronage of the great powers without risking global thermonuclear war at a very, very high level, we have to find other ways to settle our disagreements. It has been, for the last 20 years, the only way we've been able to affect our near-peer and rising peer adversaries is at the bank account, is to change the value of the money itself in order to affect their buying power, their ability to acquire weapons and equipment and their ability to um, affect their ability to make war in the traditional domains. This new domain, depending on who can make, you know, what's the most valuable thing right now in the world? It might be silicon. It might be, you know, the reason that China is threatening Taiwan might be over not so much, uh, you know, political identity. It might be the ability to make microchips. It might be the most expensive thing, most valuable thing in the planet going forward. Um, I just heard Samsung is building a chip plant in Texas. That's awesome. That's very, very interesting, too. So I want to thank, this is this is kind of what I've been thinking about technology, multiple domain uh, kinds of warfare, and where the future is. I actually think that war has gotten so darn expensive on a human level, you're going to see reduction as we go forward in time, but you're going to see some really funny things happening on the internet in terms of uh, cyber crime, cyber warfare. We've already seen influence warfare in the last couple of elections. This already happens overseas, and it's going to be happening here too. I think Space Force is all about dominating this new domain that is called space. It is the observational area. The satellites that we have orbiting the planet today are the hot air balloons of the American Civil War and the spotting aircraft of World War I. The satellites are giving us the ability to look across the battlefield and look for, look for places to um, exploit our enemy's capability. And then there is this domain that's newer than that, which is cyber. There is this artificial universe that is a marketplace of information and technology. And then that is going to be fought over. There are going to be battles happening in the virtual space. And it's going to be dark and it's going to be deep. And we're not going to see it in the mainstream. But you're already hearing about the repercussions of it when a oil pipeline is shut down on the East Coast. And it's limiting the ability for East Coast uh, truckers to get fuel to move supplies, food, bandages, Walmart goods to the people. And that will eventually make the people upset and mistrust their government. Stuff like that. Pete, thanks for listening in. Pete says, good talk, Tom. Um, that was my talk for today. I want to thank some of the people who have inspired me to talk about this. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, Dan Carlin, uh, Hideo Kojima. I think, you know, when I played Metal Gear, I thought it was very silly. But then after I read Eric Prince's book, uh, Civilian Warriors, about the role of private military contactors and mercenaries throughout the course of history, I realized that Kojima's read a few things and knows a few things. Like, you know, Eric Prince is ha, is a little bit of Big Boss. There are a lot of these characters, like Big Boss is not based on just an idea, but bits and pieces of different historical figures that were one part spy, one part commando, and one part um, st strategic operative. Someone who could think very, very big picture. Somebody who could connect and talk to um, warlords and gun dealers and you know weapons manufacturers and could create supply chains um, and ways of getting 
uh, foreign forces into a fighting space in order to conduct, um, you know, gray operations in, in places where influences went. Um, Pete asks, have you read The New Rules of War? I have not, Pete. Thanks for the recommendation. The New Rules of War. There's a lot of great books out there. I want to thank H.R. McMaster, who is a general, recently on Joe Rogan. I'm going to listen to that right now. Um, H.R. McMaster, General McMaster, was in Trump's cabinet, but was also a tank commander in the Gulf War. I believe he was involved in the Battle of 76, 73 Eastings in 1991. Oh, I forgot to even talk about Iran and Iraq War. There was chemical weapons tried again in uh, the Iran-Iraq War in the 80s. It was basically World War I Part II uh, done in the Middle East, and that was absolutely horrific with over a million dead. Um, and actually a brutal war where the Middle East relearned everything the West had learned in 1917 to 1919, pretty much. But we did get to see some interesting, like, old meets new in terms of technologies where I think the Iranians were flying relatively modern American-made F-14 Tomcats. And the United States got to see the effectiveness of that versus Russian-designed uh, MiGs in that conflict. But uh, And then all those lessons that were, were learned by them, it got... <laughs> it pretty much got Saddam Hussein from World War I tactics to World War II tactics. And then when the United States and the Allies, the coalition forces invaded the 91 in Desert Storm, we absolutely annihilated them because we were in Cold War tactics and they hadn't left World War II tactics yet and technology. All right. Uh, sorry, that was a, um, a little addendum there. I highly recommend Malcolm Gladwell's Bomber Mafia audiobook if you're curious about um, strategic bombing and the lessons learned from World War II and where we find ourselves today. But we would not have the nuclear triad of deterrence, you know, being sea-based nuclear weapons, land-based nuclear weapons, and air-based nuclear weapons. Um, this mutually assured destruction concept would not exist if it wasn't for uh, strategic the idea of strategic bombing, which was actually meant to be a, a cost-saving measure compared to the waves and waves of waves of cannon fodder, uh, human meat line warfare that was lost in World War I. It's kind of wild to think about it, but, you know, strategic bombing was supposed to be precision strikes on industrial manufacturing, and it turned into just leveling cities. This was what happens when you open Pandora's box and you let uh, a monster out of it in the, in the long um, gaps of war. I also, oh, I forgot to mention the writer of The Splendid and the Vile. Let me look up that right now. Great book, uh, Winston Churchill's 1941. A great book I read last year. Uh, 19. But in the, the Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill family and defiance during the Blitz by Eric Larson. That was a really good book. It, what that did for me is made me realize that if you. The, the bombing of the the bombing of England in the Blitz went on for so long that people kind of got numb to it. They still were going out to bars and restaurants, even though the bombs were falling. And it reminded me a lot of the pandemic, how uh, the society will go along with all the safety measures for a point, you know, for like a month or two. Everyone's on board. Yeah, we can we can wait it out. But eventually, people break and they need entertainment, and they're going to go back to the way things used to be. And this was the case when. Englanders could see the Luftwaffe flying over their city and dropping bombs. And they're like, well, if it's going to hit me, it's going to hit me. Bombs are pathogens. Bombs that people can see are pathogens. Tommy's still going to go to the bar. <laughs> I hope all y'all have a great weekend. And uh, thanks for listening to my crazy lecture today. Pete, hope you have a good one. Uh, thanks for the book recommendation. Thanks, Drew, for tuning in. Um, here are some drawings I did for Sean Carpenter. Uh, at Ambush Alley Games from the Tomorrow War. And these were some concepts from when I worked at Mohawk on a game called Old World. It used to be called Ten Crowns at the time. Uh, it's been Tom Simons signing off.